In this lesson, we're going to break down landlord-tenant law. Now, big picture, probably all of us have a basic understanding of what the landlord-tenant relationship looks like, right? Of course, we're going to have a tenant who is paying rent to the landlord in exchange for a possessory interest in the landlord's property, right? And the way that this usually plays out in real property fact patterns, if we see landlord-tenant law being tested, is going to be through a situation where our tenant is paying rent to the landlord, and then eventually, right, things are going to happen that the tenant doesn't like. Usually, it's going to be some series of plumbing issues or maybe some air conditioning, some electrical problems, right? But there's going to be some issue with the least premises, right? Maybe the tenant complains about this, maybe the tenant doesn't complain about this, but ultimately it's going to lead to a dispute between the landlord and the tenant. And usually, right, you're going to see the tenant wanting to terminate the lease early and get out of their rent obligations. And the question is ultimately going to be whether the tenant can do that and if the tenant can't do that, right, how do we calculate the damages the landlord might be entitled to, right? Big picture, that's kind of what we're gonna see, right? Eventually, the tenant stops paying rent and the landlord is going to want to sue that tenant for unpaid rent. You know, how do we analyze that fact pattern? Well, big picture, right, the first thing we always wanna do is properly categorize the type of landlord-tenant relationship. We'll see that there's four different types of landlord-tenant relationships. And the reason that it's important to categorize the landlord-tenant relationship correctly is because depending on which one of these we classify the relationship as, either a tenancy for years, a periodic tenancy, a tenancy at will, or a tenancy at sufferance, it's going to change the ways in which the landlord-tenant relationship can be terminated, right? And it's important to recognize that upon termination, once the landlord-tenant relationship is terminated, the obligations of both sides are going to be discharged. So once that landlord-tenant relationship is terminated, once we identify that point in time in our fact pattern, right from that point forward, the tenant no longer has a duty to pay rent and the landlord no longer owes any obligations to the tenant. So it's important to understand, well, how does the landlord-tenant relationship terminate? In order to understand that, we have to classify the tenancy correctly, right? We have to classify their relationship, the relationship between the landlord and tenant as either a tenancy for years, a periodic tenancy, a tenancy at will, or a tenancy at sufferance. All right, so we can start with the tenancy for years. This is kind of your most classic landlord-tenant relationship. Right? A tenancy for years lasts for a fixed or ascertainable amount of time. Of course, it's going to automatically terminate when the term of that lease expires with or without notice, right? So this would be you go to an apartment and apartment building and you want to lease an apartment and you enter into a lease agreement for six months, right? You have a set, a fixed and ascertainable term, right? For a six month lease of some apartment in this building, right? Well, that's a tenancy we'd call a tenancy for years, right? And it's going to automatically terminate when that six month term expires, right? You don't have to give notice to the landlord. The landlord doesn't have to give notice to the tenant when the six months runs up, it automatically terminates. Terminates, right? And remember, when that relationship terminates, the duty to pay rent terminates, all the obligations of both sides are terminated. So the tenant's duty to pay rent is going to be discharged and all of the landlord's duties to the tenant are discharged when that term expires, right? That's a tenancy for years. Important to recognize too here that it could be, as long as it's an ascertainable amount of time, it's still a tenancy for years. So say you enter into a lease agreement that says something like, when the construction of this apartment is completed, 
right? Upon completion of construction, you will enter into a lease term for six months, right? Well, that is still ascertainable, right? That's a tenancy for years. We can ascertain when construction is completed from that point, six months. It's still a tenancy for years. Just one nuance you could look for there. So of course the tenancy for years is probably the most classic form of tenancy right between landlord and tenant. Next, we do have the periodic tenancy, right? A periodic tenancy lasts for an initial fixed period, then automatically continues for additional equal periods until either side gives advanced notice. Most classically, right, this is a month to month lease. If you've ever been into a month to month lease, that's a periodic tenancy, right? Unlike a tenancy for years, the key distinction here is to terminate the landlord tenant relationship, right? One side, either the landlord or the tenant has to give advanced notice. And we typically say that the tenancy is going to terminate on the last day of the fixed period, meaning that the tenancy, the periodic tenancy cannot end in the middle of a period. Right, so if we have a month to month lease, right, that'd be a periodic tenancy, right? And say that your monthly rent is due on the first of each month, right? And it's just month to month. We don't have a fixed or ascertainable amount of time that the lease is going to last for. It's just going month to month. So to terminate this relationship, either the landlord or the tenant has to give notice, advance notice, to the other side. And typically we say that the advance notice has to be equal to whatever that fixed period is. So if it's a month to month lease, right? Well, a month is 30 days, so you'd have to give 30 days advance notice. If it's a two month to two month fixed term, right? You'd have to give 60 days advance notice. At common law, if it's a really long stretch of period of time, if it's a year to year, right, situation, then the advance notice would have to be six months, right? If our period, right, our fixed period is actually a full year, at common law, we would say advance notice is six months. But for shorter fixed periods, right, like a month to month lease, we'd say the advance notice has to be at least 30 days. For a two month, right, two month to two month period, we'd say the advance notice needs to be 60 days. But important to recognize, right, that the periodic tenancy terminates on the last day day of the fixed period. So classically what you'll see is somebody tries to terminate the tenancy in the middle of a period. So say that our period is from the first of each month, right? Say rent is due on the first of each month. So say that it's June 15th, right? In a month to month lease, a periodic tenancy, month to month lease, rent is due on the first of each month and in the middle of a month, say it's June 15th, right? the tenant wants to put in advance notice to terminate the lease, to terminate the landlord-tenant relationship. Well, if they put in that notice on June 15th, right, we know that you have to give at least 30 days notice, right? The advance notice has to be equal to whatever the fixed period is. So a month to month lease, we know you have to give 30 days advance notice. So the earliest point in time would be July 15th, right? 30 days after June 15th would take us to July 15th. But the periodic tenancy cannot terminate in the middle of a term, right? It terminates on the last day of the fixed period. So if you put in your notice on June 15th, you would go fast forward 30 days because that's how long the advance notice has to be. That takes you to July 15th, but it can't terminate in the middle of a period. You go to the last day. So it ends up being July 31 would be the day that that landlord tenant relationship terminates. So the tenant would still be responsible, still liable for rent up until July 31, right? Because you can't terminate a periodic tenancy in the middle of the period, right? So the easy way to remember this is because classically what you're going to see if periodic tenancy is being tested is a month to month lease, right? It's the last day of the next month. So if you put in your notice on June 5th, right? The earliest it can terminate is going to be July 31. If you put it on June 10th, it's going to terminate on July 31. If you put it on Jul June 15th, it's going to terminate on July 31. If you put it on June 24, right, it's going to terminate on July 31, right? It's the last day of the next month. Assuming that it's a month to month lease and rent is due on the first of each month, that's typically how it's going to work, right? Because the periodic tenancy terminates on the last day of the fixed period, whatever that fixed period is 
is, right? You can't terminate a periodic tendency in the middle of a period. Right, but that's the periodic tendency. Remember, the key distinction here between the periodic tendency and the tendency for years is there's no automatic termination. That thing is just going to keep going, keep going until either side gives advance notice. Remember, the tendency for years just lasts for that fixed period of time that it automatically terminates, whether there's notice or not, right? Then we get to the tenancy at will. A tenancy at will has no fixed duration and lasts only so long as both the landlord and tenant desire. It may be terminated at any time for any reason with or without notice, right? So the tenancy at will basically requires no advance notice. It's just going until either side either expressly gives notice or takes action that's inconsistent with continuing the lease term, right? A tenancy at will either side, right? The landlord and to or tenant can basically terminate it at any time for any reason, right? They don't even have to give notice, right? So how do you terminate it without giving notice, right? The tenant could just abandon the apartment, right? The tenant could just abandon the leased premises, right? That would constitute, right, ending a tenancy at will, right? It can be implied by the party's conduct. It can be expressed. You can give notice, right? A tenancy at will is the most flexible. It just goes and goes until either the landlord or the tenant wishes to terminate the tenancy, right? And remember that can be express, right? Either side can just say, hey, I want to terminate this because it's a tenancy at will, right? Either side can say, hey, I no longer want to be in this and just can walk out the door and it's over, right? Tenancy at will does not require the type of advance notice that a periodic tenancy has, right? And to create a tenancy at will, you'd usually want to see some sort of language, right? The distinction between the periodic tenancy and the tenancy at will is that in the terms of the agreement, right? It'll usually say something like either side can terminate the lease agreement at will, right? Important to recognize if it's one-sided, if the tenancy at will clause in the lease says that only the landlord can terminate at will, if that's in there, we actually say that the tenant can also terminate at will. You can't be in a one-sided lease agreement where only the landlord can terminate at will, but you can flip that. You could have a valid lease agreement where the power to terminate is only to the tenant, right? Where the landlord can't terminate, but the tenant can terminate, right? That would be acceptable under a tenancy at will. The key distinction between the tenancy at will and the periodic tenancy is there is no notice requirement to terminate the tenancy. You can terminate the tenancy at any time for any reason with or without notice, right? Finally, we get to the tenancy at sufferance. A, ten a tenancy at sufferance exists when a tenant in rightful possession of land wrongfully continues possession after the right ends. The term of the prior lease controls until either the landlord evicts the tenant, the landlord releases the land to the tenant, or the tenant voluntarily vacates. So this would be a holdover situation, right? Say you have a tenancy for years, right? That lasts six months, right? Say you have a tenancy for years that lasts six months, or say it'd probably be easier to see even with a periodic tenancy or a tenancy at will. Say you're in a month to month lease and the landlord properly gives you 30 days notice to vacate the premises, right? The landlord does it by the book, gives you the amount of time to vacate. Say the landlord gives you that notice to vacate on June 15th. So you have to be out by August 1st, right? You have to vacate the premises by August 1st, right? Say that tenant refuses to vacate on August 1st, right? They continue to stay in the apartment until, or the lease premises after August 1st. Well, that's when we're going to have a tenancy at sufferance, right? They're wrongfully in possession still, right? A tenancy at sufferance exists when a tenant in rightful possession of the land wrongfully continues possession after that right ends, right? So the landlord tenant relationship was supposed to end on July 31. So that tenant had to be out of the property by August 1st, right? By July 31st to August 1, that tenant had to vacate the property, right? But by refusing to vacate and staying in, that's when it's going to become a tenancy at sufferance. And we say, 
the terms of the prior lease control until either the landlord evicts the tenant, the landlord releases the land to the tenant, or the tenant voluntarily vacates. So that monthly rent, right, the tenant is still on the hook for that. The prior lease controls, so if the month to month rent was $2,000 a month, right, the tenant is still going to be on the hook. If they just refuse to leave and stay there, right, the prior terms are still going to control, right? So that tenant is still going to be responsible for the $2,000 a month, right? And if the tenant refuses to pay that, well, the landlord would be entitled to recover that in an action for unpaid rent, right? And that's going to continue to accrue until either the landlord evicts the tenant, right? And you don't need to know the eviction process. You just need to know that that'll accrue until the landlord evicts the tenant. The landlord releases the land to the tenant. So they enter into a new contract, right? Well, that new contract will now control or the tenant voluntarily vacates. Once the tenant does finally leave, okay, now that's going to officially terminate the agreement. That prior lease that was controlling during the tenancy at sufferance ends when the tenant voluntarily vacates. But important to recognize that time that the tenant remained in wrongful possession of the land, they're still going to be liable for the rent under the prior terms of the prior agreement. All right, so that's how the tenancy at sufferance works. It's usually, right, the way you would see that is the holdover tenant, right? Their term ends, but the tenant refuses to leave. That's essentially the tenancy at sufferance. Right, so step one is always going to be in a landlord tenant kind of analysis. We do want to properly classify the relationship as either the tenancy for years, periodic tenancy, tenancy at will, or the tenancy at sufferance, because this is going to affect ultimately how the tenancy is terminated. And we know once the tenancy is terminated, once that landlord tenant relationship is terminated, the obligations of both parties are discharged. So the tenant's duty to pay rent will be discharged and whatever duties the landlord owes to the tenant will also be discharged from that point moving forward. So it's very important for us to classify it correctly so we can identify the exact moment in time where those duties are discharged, right? So. When we're thinking about duties, right, the next kind of step in the analysis to understand is, well, let's clearly define what these duties are. What duties does the tenant owe to the landlord? And what duties does the landlord owe to the tenant? Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like 
um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Sudakata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudakata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive, that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career, and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.